you act exactly as you do in every other industry. You have, you know, a, a trust and verify process and come in and make sure things are happening exactly as they say they're being happened. And I, and I think that uh, we have lots of good examples from other industries on how to make that happen. Rachel, how would you do it? Yeah, so I think the challenge for regulators is if you take this up a level and you look at what's happening is that we're moving, we're in this trust shift. Um, so for a long time, trust existed in traditional institutions, and we're seeing how that's being eroded. And trust um, flowed in a very top-down, hierarchical fashion. There was a very linear relationship between the company and the consumer. And what's happening is that's being blown up in many ways, and we're seeing this distribu distributed form of trust that now flows sideways directly to individuals, whether that's strangers, peers, colleagues, whatever it is. And this is a real challenge for regulators because a lot of regulation is designed for traditional institutions. It's designed to think in this top-down hierarchical way. So when you start looking and you talk to regulators and you're talking about how do you regulate a platform, how do you break up these network monopolies, the way regulators naturally think is, well, where is the center? Where is the center of accountability? And that's a real problem when you have millions, billions of users who are essentially the product. And so was, I think we're seeing this play out with Facebook this, uh, this week when you know, they said the users are now, uh, they're the ones that rate the content and there's been this backlash. But we have to ask ourselves what we want. Do we want Facebook to be the arbiter of truth? Do we want uh, there to be a group of experts and regulators to decide what news is trustworthy? Or do we want we, the users, to decide? So I think that's the challenge is that regulation, a lot of regulation is still stuck in this institutional mindset, and it hasn't yet adapted right. fast enough to these distributed networks and systems. OK, so let me ask you this. Just, just oh, go just ahead, on one please. point on that. I, I think that it is, it, there's no way that regulators, regulators are going to be able to keep up with the speed I wish to. I think it's, it's too much of an ask, and I think what, where the regulators can play a part is for accountability. I think that often the higher up you are in organizations, the less accountable you are. And, and my ask of regulators would be to be hard in their accountability so that a CEO um, knows that he or, she, he or she's job is to know what's going on at the company, and if they don't and they get caught, they're out. Okay, I think, I think that's what the regulator can, can do. I do think that, um, trying to talk here, the press is playing a very big part and a good part in bringing much of this uh, out. I think that there's, there's more information now about what is going on with these companies deep down. You know, I'm a little mixed because at Uber, there have been a ton of leaks, et cetera, about what's happened to Uber. And that's not necessarily a great way to run a company. But if I step back, the leaks and the Susan Fowler exposure, et cetera, it, it not only started uh, a real cultural change that is, was painful for Uber, but incredibly positive. Right. The leaks, et cetera, led Uber to finally understand that it had to make the changes that it is making as a company to, to break from the past and go forward as a company that does the right thing. And the, and the press played a very, very big part in it. Right. So I'm hoping that the press can be a big part of the solution going right. forward. Can I just add, given uh, building on the point um, about the pace of change and how do you have regulation that keeps up with the pace of change, there's one very strong example that's in place right now, and that's the EU code of conduct. And setting a, setting a standard, making it clear what's expected, I very much agree, is what should be the rallying point. And we, we need to individually and collectively to be investing to ensure that we're creating that kind of experience. Right. Do, do you know, I think one thing that's interesting and I think is, is uh, quite disappointing is that a lot of regulation seems to be calling for transparency. And you hear this a lot, right? You hear the way to build more trust is to be more transparent. But trust and transparency, they're not synonymous with one another. You've actually given up on trust if you need for things to be in transparent. So I don't understand why that's the call that we want these organizations to be transparent. What we need to believe is that they're trustworthy, that we trust their intentions. And to Mark's point, this isn't a brand attribute. It's not something that's managed by a communication team. It's embedded into the DNA of the entire organization. So every decision that's made, every design decision is, that's made, that we can trust those intentions. So I think the call should not be for more transparency. It's that we understand the intentions of these companies. Mm -hmm. And we believe that the intentions of these companies are aligned with ours as individuals and ours as a society. Can I ask you a separate question? Given, given the rise of cryptocurrency, and I know everybody, even last night, was talking about Bitcoin. Jeez. That, to me, in a way, is uh, a direct correlation with the lack of trust 
that people have in large organizations, and yet a tremendous trust in technology. Mm. Anybody? Well, that's, I mean, that's what's so interesting is when you have an erosion of trust in traditional institutions, so in this sense, the banks or the financial institution, you create a trust vacuum. And interesting things rise up in a vacuum. Interesting alternatives rise up in a vacuum. So we see that in the world of financial services with cryptocurrencies and the blockchain. And what's so interesting about the blockchain is that you know, people often say, oh, there's no trust. Well, yeah, you have to trust the idea. And you have to trust the technology. You just don't have to trust the other user. And so I think that's you know, a lot of chaos and, and confusion in the world. And a lot of pain can actually be described, uh, explained by this trust vacuum. You know, we also see it in politics. And so I think one of the questions for technology is, is it enabling us to trust, place our trust in the right people in the right places, or is it encouraging us to give our trust away too easily? The trust Edelman barometer, though, this year, has